Hello and welcome. My name is Joe O'Mara. I'm the Head of Aviation Finance with KPMG. And on behalf of KPMG and Ireland Economics, I'm delighted to be joined by Angus Kelly. Angus is the CEO of Aircap and is joining us for the purposes of our Aviation Leaders Report. I should say we're recording this in early December. Angus, thanks again. Always great to get your insights. Um, given the size and breadth of Aircap, can you talk to us a little bit about how you've seen the recovery progress over the course of 2022? The recovery has been strong, Joe, and it's been a continuation of what happened towards even the end of 2020 in certain markets. The trend was always there. There was never a doubt that the consumer was going to travel again. That, that was never in question. And we saw that even go back to the Chinese market. It hit rock bottom, Chinese New Year, February 2020. After Chinese New Year, I should say. But by August of that year, it had come back to almost 100% of pre-COVID traffic. And that was the first major market we saw at Aircap coming back. And that is one of the advantages of the, the breadth, the scale of the business, that you have more information than anyone else and you see stuff before anyone else. So you could see that, that that was happening and then the state started to move. Now, of course, we were rocked by different variants of COVID and it made temporary setbacks, but what people were hearing in the news media of you know, there will be a permanent structural change in the demand for air travel and people willingness to travel, that was never the case. And we saw that continue through late 21 into 22. So, you know, the, the first market after China, well, it closed again, but then you had the States, Europe, and most recently we've got Southeast Asia, which is again following the same trends that we saw in all the other markets where initially the first flight, people are a little bit concerned about going through an airport, the large groups of people, they take a short flight, they want to stay close to home, ideally in their own country in case something goes wrong, that they're not trapped in a foreign country. But then after they've taken their first flight, the second flight's much easier, the third flight, etc. And so I'm extremely confident that the trend that we've seen in 2022, and prior to that, as I mentioned, will continue. Uh, we've had, um, encouraging news out of China in the last three or four days. Maybe by the time this is broadcast, hopefully we'll be on a, on a very clear track as to the resumption of travel in China. So even if we do have a downturn in uh, the US or Europe next year due to recessionary concerns, I'm very confident in our space that um, if we continue to see things move in China and Southeast Asia, that will cushion the industry from, from those issues over here. So looking out into 23 and, and lots of positives there, on the opportunity side, are you thinking particular regions or, or where is your perspective on where you think the big opportunities for next year will be? I think for us, you know, speaking to uh, about AirCap specifically, uh, we obviously are looking to harvest the benefits of the acquisition of GCAS and that will be a prime focus for us, the synergies that that brings through our engine business, um, the scale of our presence with the OEMs at, at individual airlines. Uh, in terms of what will happen for others, you know, will there be opportunities for others? Hopefully we'll see some consolidation elsewhere in the industry. I think it is a, a positive thing and um, I would hope we'll see a bit of that uh, in the industry. And, and kind of balanced against that opportunity side, we're in a challenging macroeconomic and geopolitical situation, um, and maybe focusing on, on one of those elements around interest rates, which we've seen you know, significant volatility on. We knew rates were gonna rise, but, but probably quicker than people expected. How has that impacted on your business, and, and what are your thoughts on what that rate environment means going forward? Well, there are a couple of things where it in, impacts on the business. Uh, well, first and foremost, you have the assets themselves, the lease rates go up with them. And that has been happening that um, as we've seen increasing interest rates over the last 10 months, lease rates are going up with them. On the brand new airplanes, it's almost instantaneous. On the used aircraft, depending on the type, it might be a bit of a lag of maybe six months or so. But that's a pretty small impact on any lessor because how much of your portfolio is churning in any given year and in a six month period, it's, it's pretty small. Um, in that regard. On the cost side of the business then, of course, that feeds into your funding structure. If you're a hedged business like Aircap was, we never ran an open position regard to interest rate risk, um, then your exposure to rising rates occurs as your debt mature, your debts, uh, your, your, your liabilities mature. 
but the way we run the book is that we'll have, if we have five billion of liabilities maturing in a year, we'll have five billion of assets to offset the interest rate uh, risk in the two. Now, if you weren't hedged, of course, then you're in a very tough spot. If you were uh, playing the yield curve and funding yourself you know, with three month floating money, uh, obviously you're gonna, you're gonna get hurt badly. Uh, then the other area is escalation on the um, manufacturing contracts. Uh, you know, uh, some companies uh, like Aircap will have caps that are competitive, uh, but certainly if you, if you were going to the manufacturers last year buying airplanes, uh, your escalation protection will not be anything like what it would have been two or three years ago. And that again goes back to, you know, when were you buying from the manufacturer? If you're buying from the manufacturer when they need you, it's a binary difference almost between when they don't need you. So that's where you've got to be, um, I suppose, very thoughtful about how you interact with the manufacturers because escalation, which is inflation, uh, driven by interest rates as well, goes into that. I think, as I said, that will be a concern for those who are ordering airplanes in the last 12 months, I suspect. And I might come back to the OEM point in a second, but on that inflation point, are you seeing that correlate with asset values at the moment? Well, we certainly are. We've sold a lot of assets uh, during the year. We've managed to print fairly healthy gains as well. And um, we had some very strong gains there in the last quarter and uh, good, good asset sales. I think when it comes to asset sales, though, it is worth noting that capital is not as plentiful as it was because certain avenues of capital are, are not open at the moment. Uh, most notably, I suppose, the ABS, even though there was a small ABS deal done earlier in the week, uh, which is the second one of the year. But the, um, besides that, uh, I think for us, what we found is if you're uh, selling blocks of assets, you know, 250 million or less, you'll still get pretty good competitive tension. Um, so long as you know where the buyers are, what type of buyers uh, want what types of assets. And that comes from a lot of experience of understanding the buyer base of airplanes. Not all buyers want the same thing. They have very different targets, um, be it yield targets, age targets, type targets, customer exposure targets, regional targets, and you're building a port small little portfolios for all of those types of buyers, and indeed airline buyers, because we're selling more airplanes to airlines than ever before. Um, like Aircap is the biggest seller of used aircraft in the world by obviously a country mile. And what we are seeing uh, for the first time in our history is the amount of old airplanes being bought by airlines. Now, why are they doing that? They're doing that because they know Boeing and Airbus won't be able to deliver. And you know, last night, Airbus eventually caved in and told the market what everybody knew, they'd never get to 700 deliveries. And uh, they weren't ever gonna get to 720, they won't get to 700 as we know, and um, we'll see if they hit the targets. And the airlines know that themselves, and that's why they are buying so many used airplanes, 17, 18 year old aircraft, that they never thought they would be buying, but they have to now because they need to have the lift. And maybe let's, let, let's keep going with that OEM theme then for a moment, right? So that, that supply chain challenges, the engine challenges have been there both on supply chain side and maybe some technology issues. How challenging has that been you know, to the growth plans you'd have? As you say, you'd have huge order books with the OEMs. Just the challenging nature of that and just what impact it's having on the business. And as you say, correlating into the trading environment. I mean, we've been telegraphing this for a long time um, because we've seen what's happening on the ground. As I said, that's one of the things of being our size. You see stuff before, before others. Uh, so it's not a surprise to us. So what we're trying to do, you know, who we're most concerned about is our customers. Uh, the challenge for a customer is if they put uh, seats for sale for next summer, they need to know they have the airplane, they have the seats. You know, they, they have the crews, They've booked the airport slots, they've booked the catering costs, all that is fixed costs that the airlines have. Now they have to get the revenue or else it's a huge cost to them. And if the airplane isn't there, they won't get the revenue. So the challenge for the airlines, for our customers today, is going to Airbus and saying, look, Airbus, you need to be upfront quickly and tell the customers. You cannot tell them in April or March for that, really March, that the airplane is not gonna be there until September. That's not good enough. The, uh, the impact for the airline is so significant because airlines make their money during the summer. If the plane isn't gonna be there, they need time in order to put in place an alternative 
solution. That can be wet leasing, which it has been mainly in the past. It could be extending airplanes they currently have. But after the last few years with the, and what's coming, I, many of the bigger airlines realize that we just can't rely 100% on what the OEMs are telling us around deliveries. So we have to make sure we have a backup plan that can be expensive, but it means having to hold on to assets that are older for longer. And bringing you back maybe to the debt market, so you mentioned the ABS market, which is you know is a very sentiment-driven market, and we've seen the challenges that have been there this year. On on the bond side, you guys obviously raised huge amounts, the GCAS acquisition, and, and at record rates. Um, when you need to go back to that market in a big way, obviously the debt will cost more, just given the rate environment we're in. Do you have any concerns that aviation, just generally as an asset class, will be at a disadvantage to where we were? You've had COVID, you've had Russia, you've had other shocks that are there that have impacted aviation, or do you think the maturing of the sector means when you go back, you know, you'll be able to access those, those markets in the same way you were before, albeit at an increased cost? Look, I think the aviation debt market has matured enormously as the industry has got so much bigger over the last 20 years and we have a liquid market. Um, even in the depths of COVID, we were able to issue very large amounts of capital into the debt markets, both um, Aircap, other lessors and the airlines for that matter. Now, more recently this year, it's been a bit more muted. Uh, you know, I personally think those ABS, uh, the senior bonds are fantastic value today. Uh, that you're getting, if we look at the one that went out last week, um, single A rated bond, 7% yield, secured uh, is a great deal. Uh, we then saw Air Lease open up the unsecured bond market uh, just recently. They did uh, 700 million, they had a very strong order book. That's, I think, shows the maturity of the sector of the, the bond and uh, the debt investor um, base that they know this is a good business and they should seize value when they can get it. Um, that being said, I mean, it's not all about the bond market. This year, now, we didn't do a trip to the bond market, but we still did four and a half billion away from the bond market. And uh, all of the spreads were inside. We had a one handle on them, uh, which was uh, pretty compelling stuff. So there are other, and so that, you know, that's, uh, there are other forms of financing besides the bond market. And as I said, we, we did over four billion ourselves this year. So I feel that for me, if you're a bond investor, the bond investors are always, you know, the glass half full. That's the, that's the mentality of, of many debt investors, and rightly so. But what they saw was the worst possible stress that you could have. The world stopped flying. It doesn't get any worse you know, for, for aviation or for any business when there's no revenue coming in. Um, as the CEO of Virgin called me, uh, it's probably one of several calls I got in April 2020 saying, a bad news, Shai is his name, Shai Weiss. And Shai said, he said, Gus, really bad news. I said, what's that? I never realized my revenue line is 100% variable. I've just grounded the fleet. So there was no revenue. So I think many investors saw the, the strength of the leasing business model and the ability of the leasing companies to withstand uh, tremendous shocks. Um, and we never got one nickel of government support, the industry. Not one leasing company got any support, or at least not Western ones at any rate. Um, and we all made it through and uh, we came out of it uh, far stronger than when we went into it. So I think for me, it's shown the investors that well-run global leasing companies are extremely investable. And this was the worst stress they could have ever imagined and beyond it. And we came through it. And maybe feeding into then a couple of points you made around scale, obviously you guys are far and away the largest that are there, but you have a population of IG rated lessors, as you say, can, can tap those sources or various sources of finance. Scale is always important in any sector, in any business, but in leasing, has it increased in importance post pandemic? I think so. I think it was always important to the industry has been fragmented for a long time. And I do think that we, it's not just us who's doing the consolidating. I, 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 you know, we're seeing that with SNBC. We've seen it over the years at Bank of China. Um, um, we've seen it with Carlisle. I think we'll continue to see it. I mean, where scale really matters is stuff many observants can't see, maintenance. The biggest controllable cost of a leasing company on an annual basis is maintenance. Because SG&A is kind of known the interest rate expense, you know, it's fixed the day you do the deal, but on a week-to-week, day-to-day basis, maintenance 
is the biggest cost item there. And sometimes it's capitalized, sometimes it runs through the P&L, but it's by far the biggest um, cash flow item you can control as a leasing company. And there, that's where scale has enormous advantages, dealing with an MRO shop, uh, getting your slots, having the knowledge internally to know how to overhaul an engine, to know how to overhaul an APU landing gear, how to deal with the avionics units, how to deal with the vendors, of all those different things. That for me is the hidden area where people will say, oh, is it, is it the manufacturers? Of course the manufacturers are, without scale, you're just irrelevant to them. Um, and then when it comes to the financing markets, of course, scale is a huge advantage. I mean, no one wants to really buy a bond if you're just doing a few hundred million. I mean, it's kind of, it's illiquid. They won't want to, the, the investors need liquidity. That's the big attraction of uh, where aircraft leasing has come is the quantum of debt going into the market every year. If you're doing a trip to the markets once a year for a few hundred million, you may as well not bother, to be honest. Uh, you're, you're, you'll always pay a premium above where your rating uh, would, would suggest you should be. And that, if you kind of posit that and say, yes, yeah, scale is more important, it, it probably feeds into two elements to get your thoughts on. One, do you expect to see more consolidation? Um, and, and two, are the barriers to entry for new platforms that bit higher than they were previously? Um, you know, the, um, the barrier to entry and the barrier to success are very different. So in theory, you know, you and I, Joe, could start a leasing business tomorrow, get, you know, $50 million and buy an airplane and we're, well, hey, we're off. Um, I really don't think you can be successful in the long term without a global platform. Because it's all well and good to say there's demand for assets in Jakarta and your airplane is in Mexico City. If you don't know how to move that airplane, First of all, knowing the demand is there, having the relationship, knowing the customer, knowing what they want, and then having the internal ability, legal, insurance, contracts, technical, to move that, take it back from the carrier in Mexico, move it to the carrier in Indonesia, get it there on time, on spec, on budget. You're gonna be a loser in the business if you can't do that. And I just don't see how smaller platforms are going to compete against the much bigger platforms when it comes to it. You'll always be playing second fiddle when it comes to an airline is looking for aircraft. It's just easier for them. They'll go to the bigger guy who can give them two, three, four, five of the same unit. If you come along, you, you may be lucky, you're a very small guy, you got one, two airplanes um, where someone bigger might have put in three or four and the airline said, oh, well, you know, um, we know that there was six or seven airplanes in the Mexican carrier, we want them all. So they might go to Aircap and say, okay, Aircap has three or four of them. Can you tell us who the other two guys are? And sometimes that's how some of the marketing happens for some of these guys. Um, I, I, but I, I will say this, I mean, I don't think you have to be a thousand airplanes either. Um, but I do think that to be uh, effective, to, to, have a, uh, to justify the cost base, that there has to be some scale in the business or else, because um, it's an extremely investable asset, is to have a manager who has that capability, who has a large platform. You know, you don't have to build a platform yourself. If you want to invest in the space, because it's a very investable asset, again, as COVID has shown, um, the, uh, an aircraft is an excellent asset if it's well managed. And so uh, an alternative way, and maybe a more cost-effective way, uh, rather than have a smaller platform yourself, is to, if you want to invest in the space, is to do it with a bigger platform. Yeah, and you guys have played that asset manager space, you know, on occasion in the past. But, uh, and to be fair, like, um, you know, there are, there are others who are very good asset managers out there um, as well. I want to be clear about that. There are very good platforms out there also who would be more than capable of providing uh, a very high class service to investors into the space. And on the investor... But it goes back to, if it, if it hasn't got the scale, that's, uh, yeah, can, can I pick on that investor point for a moment? Have you seen any trends emerge post-COVID on the nature of investors being attracted to aviation finance? Is it still the same types of investors, um, different names with same types, or have you seen anything kind of interesting emerge on that front? You know, I think it's the, 
what you've seen is some people obviously in COVID realise that, that point I just made, Joe, that if you don't have diversification of risk, if you don't have the ability to move assets around the world in times of distress and the ability to access capital in times of stress, then this is a trickier business to be invested in. So we've seen some of those people who are invested in, in small scale without a big asset manager behind them to help them out. Some of those have, uh, have departed. But that being said, um, we've seen a plenty of um, equity capital that wants to come into the sector uh, at the moment, given how resilient it has proven to be over the last several years. And then the structural tailwind behind it of, we know demand is going up, and we know on the supply side, the OEMs have plenty of problems. So um, there is going to be demand for aircraft. They're going to be a scarce asset. And, and then that probably leads on to the importance of leasing as a financing channel. We've seen the 50% threshold being breached on that number of aircraft percentage piece. We've seen how much less source of funded new deliveries, either on you know, the order book side or the sale and lease back side. Can I get your perspectives on have we seen a substantial shift post COVID in the importance of lessors? For sure, I think it, like we all knew that leasing was going one way. Uh, airlines, for the most part, are their, their propensity to own assets is going down and their focus on moving, moving passengers around, that being their core business more and more so. So that trend was, uh, was always there. COVID accelerated that trend and the airlines realized, you know, being so asset heavy is difficult in times of volatility, not only because of the capital constraint it places in the company, more importantly, the operational constraint. You know, uh, the um, very sophisticated airlines will look at it and say, okay, I want to be able to adjust my capacity to changes in my market. Some airlines are in more volatile markets, some airlines less volatile markets, but you know, we take someone like an Emirates. They can basically hand back around 125 to 15% of their capacity in any given year. So they know that that's a huge risk mitigation tool for them. Whereas if you owned 100% of your fleet and you need to hand back 15% of it in a given year in a period of deep distress, you either sell it at a huge loss and with no lease back, uh, nothing you're trying to sell an airplane as is, where is, which you don't do, um, and then you're stuck with all the crew, et cetera, et cetera, the costs associated with, uh, with having the, the airplane in, in, the, uh, in the business and losing money, because every time it goes up, it's losing money, you can't fill the airplane. And that was happening a lot um, during COVID to airlines who had too much of the uh, fleet on their own balance sheet. But so, you know, look, there's, uh, it depends um, region by region and airline by airline how much they need to lease, how much they should lease and what they do uh, lease. But there's no doubt, I think, that um, as we move forward, that trend uh, is, is, going, is, is well past, well past 50% by value, well, well past it. And can I bring you then maybe to an asset focus? Obviously, you know, if you ask most people, the most investable metal, it's, it's narrow body, new technology of which you would have lots and you've transitioned very much to that new technology fleet in recent times. Beyond that, what else are you seeing as kind of, you know, attractive metal to invest in? Well, again, you know, look, we, we said it at, uh, a, a while ago, the wide body market came back as well, led by the North Atlantic. And again, just the, the uh, this is public information. I mean, the supply side is crucial. And what's happening on supply? Uh, the inventory of 787s that Boeing have of over 100 units uh, per Boeing's investor day presentation, it'll be into 2025 before they can deliver what's built, already built, customers want, finished product, but has to be reworked due to the uh, FAA um, uh, requirements imposed, uh, the, the, the requirements imposed by the FAA on Boeing. Uh, Airbus um, are making about two and a half A330 NEOs a month. I think it'll be uh, probably 2024, 2025 before they can get above three. Uh, the 777X is delayed again. So in the wide body space, there's a real scarcity. And a lot of airplanes during COVID were converted to freight or retired permanently. So the wide body space is one where, again, we saw it come back um, pretty strongly, and we see it through our engine business too. You know, we had a, a, a large number of GE90s, which power the 777, on the deck um, at the end of, um, 20, towards the third quarter of 2021. 
but now we're sold out of G90s. We don't have, we had, we managed to come across four uh, recently, but just today they were gone within 72 hours. Um, so that gives, that gives us an insight to what's happening on every platform because we're the biggest engine leasing business in the world too. Um, and on the G90, which is a you know, wheel workhorse of the wide body business, we've seen tremendous demand for that, for that engine and the airplane as well, to be fair. And the 330, uh, you know, the, uh, the Trent engine on the 330 is an excellent engine. Um, Roll still have a bit of work to do on the Trent 1000 and the, and the Trent 7000 on the 78 and the A330 Neo. Um, but I think, you know, as I look out now, I would say the wide body market is one where um, there's real scarcity. And OEMs are very, very reluctant to build a wide body on spec. They're reluctant enough to build a narrow body, but at least a narrow body, you know there's a very big market for them. You know that, okay, look, if it's all economy, it's not that much of a, a cost if someone, if a guy falls down on you to move it to another guy, but a wide body, no way. If someone falls down on a wide body, uh, the OEM is looking at 12 months, maybe more, probably more, probably 18 months to reconfigure an airplane that's brand new to the next guy by the time you order the seats for everything the next guy wants. Um, and so they'll be very hesitant to ramp up production without very solid demand uh, behind the wide body uh, 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 production line. And shifting gears, Angus, maybe on the ESG side with particular focus on the E. Can you talk to us about the challenges that's posing for Aircap as of now and how you see those challenges developing in the medium term? Well, look, we see them as opportunities, you know, um, when, we, when, we look, when we look at there's E, there's S and there's G, you know. Um, we want to make sure we make some impact in the communities we operate in. Um, we, uh, we, we think it's uh, the least we can do. We've been very successful. Uh, in different parts of the world, we have um, an engineering aeronautical engineering scholarship program in Southeast Asia, and Chulakorn University in Bangkok. We have one in Limerick. We have the aviation one here in Dublin as well. So that's you know encouraging more people, y- younger people, to come into the aviation business. Um, on the on the E part of it, we're doing all we can with. Uh, bring in, we're the biggest buyer of new technology assets in the world, we have the biggest portfolio of new technology assets in the world. So we're doing as much as we can on that front and do we the biggest order book in the world as well, I guess. Um, so that's what we can do there. And then um, on the G side, you know, that's, that, that's the most, I think for, for an individual company, the G is the most important part. You know, your board of directors, your shareholders, management, how they come together, that there's no daylight between the board, the management, um, and there's a very positive relationship there and everybody internal audit these functions. These are very important parts of how a well-run business operates for a long time and is durable. It's built on process, procedures, policies, adherence to those, a strong audit committee, internal audit. It's a shout out to being an accountancy firm, Joe. Um, but I, I do think like that's, uh, people think this business is about flashy deal making. It's like any business. It's got to be built on very solid foundations from the ground up within the business. And Angus, can I ask you, just maybe coming back to the GCAS integration, um, we're just over a year since the transaction successfully closed for you. Um, Can you talk to me a little bit around what has been the most pleasing aspect of it a year on and what have you found is the most challenging? The most challenging was the Russians. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) can't blame GCAS for that. no, no. (laughs) No, I mean, look, the... We've been very, uh, very fortunate in, uh, in the quality of the people that have come together uh, to drive the business forward. We always knew, look, travel was going to, 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 uh, to grow strongly. That, that was never in doubt. We could see that coming back. The pace that it's come back at has surprised us, of course, and that's been a big positive. Uh, all business units, um, be it the fixed wing, cargo, helicopters, engines, uh, they've all outperformed, and that's down to the people, of course. And, and you know, we've had the good macro uh, tailwind behind us. And as I look forward on the structural side, as I mentioned, on the supply side, most importantly, that's going to be in our favour for a while, I think. And just in closing, Angus, uh, excellent insights as always, really appreciate it. You know, we talked a lot of opportunities that are there, but some challenges that are in the market. As you look out into 23, what are your optimism levels like? Pretty high, pretty high. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can't legislate for the black swan events that can occur, like the Russians or what have you, but 
Um, I think as I look, for, I look out now, um, I look at the, the supply demand dynamic, I look at the, uh, the, the, uh, the recovery in Asia in particular. Yes, we hear a lot of headlines about what happens in Europe and the US, and there's no doubt there may well be uh, a downturn or recession in the US and in Europe next year. Um, how deep that will be, we'll see. But you've got to remember, we're, still, we're almost at 2019 traffic in both of those markets already. And we've yet to see an enormous market come back um, to anywhere near 2019 levels in Southeast Asia. And then all of China is currently, you know, still only at 12, 13 percent to 2019 levels because of the lockdowns over the last year. So I think if we see uh, the recovery continue in Southeast Asia, China, um, that we get a path out of the zero COVID, which given what we've seen in the last three or four days, uh, hopefully, and maybe by the time this goes live, we'll know more. But if those two things are there, and even if we do have a downturn, I'm still very confident in demand for aircraft, as I said, and a key component of that is what's happening on the supply side. Well, Angus, on that optimistic note, uh, I'd like to thank you as always for your input and wish you and Aircap a very successful 2023.